that the title of my talk is a wide one, a generic one, uh, which probably raises high expectations, which I fear will sadly remain unsatisfied today. Um, however, with this title, Herodotus' version words, uh, writing the Greeks intentional histories or stories, I will comment on this fun later on. With this title, I am consciously um, introducing and suggesting a direction, possibly or at least partially a new direction towards a new methodological approach to Herodotus' aims and modes of doing history and writing about history, and consequently towards a new reading of Herodotus' narration of the Persian War. To this very aim, I will also be very selective, maybe too much, um, in describing the ancient evidence on which my research is built. But ag again, my primary goal today is to suggest a methodological approach to Herodotus' narration in light of the concept of intentional history. My paper today will divide in three parts. The first one actually is a theoretical and methodological introduction to the mechanisms of historical memory within and beyond historiography in light of a recent interdisciplinary set of heuristic tools which have been developed in connection with the sociology and anthropology of memory, notably that of Nemo history by Jan Asman and that of intentional history by Hans-Joachim Gerke. The second part briefly sketches the contents of my recent book on the prehistoriographical memory of the Persian Wars, and in doing so, uh, synthetically describes how the Persian Wars were remembered, narrated, represented, uh, especially in Athens, but not limited to, from their immediate aftermath to the half of the fifth century. Uh, therefore, before Herodotus recounted them or began recounting them in historiographical form. The last part shows and compares how the Second Persian War, War was represented during the 70s and 60s by the different polis who had participated to them and how they are narrated by Herodotus. We will see that they do not overlap and we will accordingly draw uh, some at least partial conclusions. So here we go. I will now share a PowerPoint with you. It should work. Um, please note that in the first part of my talk, I will mention several studies and several um, scholars. Um, I have not included them, the, the complete bibliographical references in the slides, but please feel free to drop me a line if you'd like to receive a complete list of references. This is the starting point of my um, presentation um, and my investigation. Uh, that is the current assumption that the Persian Wars and Herodotus' Persian War are equivalent. In other terms, that the Persian Wars happened in their historical reality exactly as uh, Herodotus recounts them. Um, you will agree that, with me that at every level, uh, both academic and more general, the Persian Wars are usually narrated exactly as Herodotus narrates them. I'm not only referring to um, the development of the main military events, uh, who fights against who, who is allied with whom, who wins, who loses, but also and foremost to that huge whole of paramilitary episodes, sub-episodes, topics, uh, themes, um, such as preparations for battle, defensive and offensive strategies, embassies, requests for help, setup of alliances, behavior of different protagonists, both individual and collective actors, motivations lying behind their behavior, psychological reactions, speeches on the battlefield, dialogues and debates among the protagonists, collective decisions such as the evacuation of a city, intervention of divine powers, interpretation of oracles, natural phenomena, and so on. All this is integral to Herodotus' narration of the Persian Wars and accordingly to almost every modern narration of the Persian Wars. Today, I will question this assumption on the basis of three main reasons stemming from three research lines, which you can see uh, summarized here, uh, which have been developed quite recently and still are under development, 
and are all influenced in theoretical and methodological terms by the so-called memory studies and the anthropology of oral tradition. The first research line is that focusing on the ways and forms the Greeks remembered, represented, and narrated their past. Especially influential have been Jan and Aleida Asman's reflection on cultural memory dating to the 90s and the more recent concept of intentional history by Hans Joachim Gerke. Jan Asman, in an important book devoted to cultural memory in ancient civilization, Greeks included, theorized two modes of collective memory, two ways in which any um, organized uh, community across different spaces and times remember their past the cultural and the communicative memory. The first refers to a distant past, both mythical and historical, um, which is interpreted as a foundational to a group's identity. Cultural memory is officially and purposefully established from a top power, is formally transmitted by trained specialists and is tied to material objectivations. Communicative memory refers instead to recent and contemporary history going back for a maximum of three generations. It is informal. It comes into being through um, everyday interaction by common people, and it is neither um, ceremonialized nor objectified. Um, I will not examine these categories in depth, uh, also because uh, they cannot be um, perfectly applied to uh, the Greek memorial culture. Uh, but I mentioned them just to give you a hint of the theoretical and methodological panorama lying behind this kind of research. The only thing I would like to stress, uh, um, since it is important to my presentation, is that uh, Jan and Aleida Asman's reflection uh, prepared the ground for the re-inclusion of uh, the dynamics of collective memory into the study of history. Memory and history actually went together in pre-modern times. It was the birth of the historical science in the 19th century, which had relegated memory outside the field of history, of scientific history. In contrast to this approach, Jan and Aleida Asman focused their attention not on how history happened, but on how history was remembered. Not on the factuality of history, but on the actuality of history. This is the perspective of Nemo history, which you can see here in a definition given by Jan Asman, not in his main book on cultural memory, but in his book, uh, Moses the Egyptian. Unlike history proper, Nemo history is concerned not with the past as such, but only with the past as it is remembered. It surveys the storylines of tradition, the webs of intertextuality, the diachronic continuities and discontinuities of reading the past. Slightly later, starting from the 2000s, Hans Joachim Gerke introduced the concept of intentionality, Geschichte, intentional history, which owes much, um, among others, to Asman's reflection. With intentional history, Gerke refers to a collective and subjective representation of a group's history, organized as a continuum from a remote myth historical past to the present, which constitutes the group's social store of shared knowledge about the past. Intentional history is, in other terms, history in a group's understanding. Please note that with the, the adjective subjective, um, Gerke does not refer to a subjective in a positivistic sense, as a, the contrary to uh, objective. Uh, subjective, it is meant from an ethno-anthropological perspective, as referring to the group's self-categorization and self-representation. Therefore, intentional history is a collectively, subjectively imagined history, which, however, this is an important point, is perceived as real, as properly historical. Differently from Asman's cultural memory, Gerke's intentional history was conceived with a specific focus on the ancient Greek world, and therefore appears as especially appropriate. Um, differently from Asman's cultural memory, Intentional history is not um, emanated and promoted from above, from a top power, but has got instead a participative nature. It is produced and at the same time turned to the group as a whole. In the case of the Polis participating to the Persian Wars, the civic communities as a whole, inclusive of their political leaders. 
Moreover, intentional history comes into being both through text, monuments, institutions, and through informal communication and everyday social interaction, and regards both the distant past and current affairs. So it puts somehow together Asman's cultural and communicative modes of collecting memory. Last important point of this combination between media of memory, objectivated forms of memory, and uh, interaction, communication, performance, favors um, the creation of a discursive arrangement, uh, favors the acquisition of a narrative form. Memories become stories. So in, intentional history is typically accompanied by the uh, production and circulation of stories about the past of intentional stories about the past. Due to all this, intentional history is, in my opinion, an appropriate tool to understand the Greek memorial culture and can be very fittingly applied to the memorialization of the Persian Wars before and in Herodotus. The second research line um, I would like to bring to your attention concerns Herodotus' method methodology as an oral historian. Much work has been done, as you all know, since the 80s on this topic. The old awareness that Herodotus was an oral historian today does not refer um, anymore only to the fact that he based his narration on the collection of oral materials, as Jacobi and Mumigliano first believed, but to the fact that he was embedded into a proper storytelling framework. He did not collect scattered oral materials or isolated oral testimonies, but he had to do with oral stories, with proper oral narratives, which were already provided with a narrative structure and a semantic framework, and which were characterized by some structural features which determine their forms and their content, contents, which I'm going to tell you about in a while. A watershed between the old conception of Herodotus as an oral historian and the new one lies in the anthropological studies which have been carried out in post-colonial Africa by Jack Cudi, Jan Wotta, Jan Van Sina, and others, starting from the 60s. That was a time when the newborn African states were trying to build their own pre-colonial history in order to legitimate their post-colonial existence. On that corpus, the only available evidence was oral, so cultural anthropologists such as Jan van Sina worked in order to build a methodology enabling them to use oral traditions as historical sources. In this framework, two main features of oral traditions were brought to light. The first is their social function. Oral traditions are transmitted only insofar as they express the group's political, cultural identity needs. The second, which is a consequence of the first, is their uh, homeostatic tendency to change in their forms, contents, and meanings in order to preserve their referentiality and validity with regard to the present. In light of these oral traditions, change constantly according to the needs of the group, which from time to time transmits them. Well, starting from the 80s, several features of the African oral traditions were detected also in Greek oral traditions. Uh, the work by Oswin Marai was absolutely pathbreaking to this regard. Marai showed that, similarly to the anthropological ones, the Greek oral traditions were deeply rooted at the local level, they played a social function, they were intrinsically related to identity matters, according to which they changed in forms and contents during their transmission, stage by stage, context by context, acquiring new items and losing others. Therefore, that they were, on the one hand, um, diachronically speaking, multi-layered, and on the other hand, synchronically speaking, multiple. There could be uh, several different uh, traditions on the same event. Marai and slightly after also Rosalind Thomas also stressed an important difference between the Greek and the anthropological oral traditions. The Greek ones do not descend from a top power of whatever kind, so they lack in a sense, officiality and canonization. They are not imposed from above, and so they intrinsically tend to be plural, and they tend to be particularly uh, malleable and uh, editable. 
the new awareness of the social function, the malleability and the stratification of Greek oral traditions led to a real change in paradigm in Herodotian scholarship, which is very clear in several studies um, starting from the 2000s, uh, for instance, the edited volume by uh, Nino Lurag in 2001, the one edited by Maurizio Gianguli in 2005, Erodoto il modello Europeo, it is pretty black here, the image, and also the two companions to Erodotus, uh, the Brill one and the Cambridge one, and also the two uh, most recent books uh, edited by Tom Harrison and Lee Sewin and by Ivan Bowie, although not specifically and completely uh, engaged with Erodotus and oral traditions, they very well witness um, how our comprehension of both Herodotus as an intellectual and historian and the historical traditions he recounts has become um, increasingly richer in the last two decades. So today it is widely acknowledged that Herodotus had to do with the multifaceted and multi-layered ensemble of stories before the histories, as Nino Luraghi once brilliantly wrote. The third research line, which has been developing partly as a consequence of the, partly as a consequence of, and partly independently from uh, the two previous ones, concerns the non-historiographical media of memory. On the background uh, of the scholarly interest into the non-historiographical forms of memory, surely is the questioning of the old 19th century belief that historiography is the only complete uh, the only faithful objective medium of history. Starting from the 70s uh, with the linguistic turn, the discursive turn, this alleged equivalence between history and historiography was first questioned. An important impulse for a new interest into other forms, into non-historiographical ways of dealing and dialoguing with the past, then came from the field of cultural anthropology uh, in regard with oral traditions, which I have already mentioned, and also from the field of uh, social memory studies with uh, the investigation of the mechanisms, meanings, and historical implications of the social practices of memory by Paul Connerton, for instance, and also Penters and Wicca. In the same years, end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, Jan and Aleda Asman, and also other scholars uh, belonging together with them to the Heidelberg group, uh, such as the art historian Tonio Hölscher, devoted a prominent attention to the media, the different types of media expressing and objectifying cultural memory, and straight, uh, straight from that framework in very recent years, uh, a new trend uh, developed, uh, the so-called uh, media memory studies. So, uh, building on uh, all uh, these theoretical and methodological framework, in my book, I have uh, analytically examined the pre-historiographical memory of the Persian wars before Herodotus. Uh, this is a hefty 500-page, uh, um, a kind of unreadable book, uh, which is the outcome of a research which lasted something like 10 years. Uh, it investigates all the forms and ways uh, through which the Persian wars were remembered, represented, and narrated before Herodotus. And it brings to light, um, surprisingly, um, to myself first, a surprisingly rich uh, submerged world of memories and stories about the Persian Wars, which took shape and circulated widely before Herodotus recounted them in historiographical form. All throughout the Pentecostia, the Athenians and the other Greeks commemorated the Persian Wars through inscriptions, monuments, portions of space, poetry for public performance, uh, so historical elegies, the Pinician Odes, the Dithyrams, uh, theater, rites, cults, festivals, also more or less private forms uh, such as vases and symphotic songs. Um, within this uh, panorama, um, a special attention I have uh, dedicated to monuments, inscriptions, and spaces as recipients of oral commentaries and oral stories, according to that phenomenon, which in anthropology is called the iconography, uh, the production of oral commentaries, uh, which were stimulated by uh, a monument, or in, in this case, an inscription or an entire portion of space. 
So um, several media of memory. It is not only about the epigrams for the fallen or uh, Simonides' elegy uh, for Platea, Aeschylus' Persians, or the marathon painting in the Swapoi Kile, just to mention a few notorious examples. But it is about an underground network of um, comments, hints, allusions uh, within several other pieces of evidence, which cannot be defined as memorials of the Persian Wars per se. However, they refer more or less explicitly uh, to the proper memorials of the Persian Wars. They dialogue with them. They build the system with them. So that um, altogether represent traces of wider discourses on the Persian Wars, which circulated widely before Herodotus. And also uh, at Herodotus's times, of course. So the, the evidence we have, um, although not quantitatively exaggerated is qualitatively extremely telling since it often allows us to detect and draw uh, relationships, semantic relationships between different forms of memory. And once we detect um, these semantic threads among different memorials, we can um, gain a glimpse uh, into the discourse surrounding the events they refer to. Uh, a glimpse into their characterization, their interpretation, their historical meaning at each stage of the process of um, memorialization. Uh, as some of you might have seen a stroll in the table of contents, in the books I have focused my attention mostly on the Athenian case, which is uh, the best documented. However, I have drawn some conclusions, which I think might be of more general validity and which you can see summarized here. Uh, first, these forms of memory were not scattered items, but together they built an interconnected multimedia and intermedia performative and dynamic system of memories. Second, thanks to their interconnectedness, they tended to acquire a textual structure to organize themselves narratively and semantically, so to originate proper oral stories. Third, these forms of memory were just the tips of icebergs, the visible parts of a submerged world of stories, of proper oral narratives about the Persian Wars. It follows that the stories which Herodotus collected, selected, and further reshaped and remolded had already gone through uh, several stages of transmission and therefore narrated the Persian Wars differently from how the Persian Wars were narrated just after the war. I now come to exemplify this statement with uh, part three concerning the Second Persian War before and in Herodotus. After the defeat of the Persians at Salamis and Plataea, Greece became a kind of ideal market of memory, an agonistic arena where every polis must underline its own contribution to the Pan-Hellenic victory. Literary and epigraphic evidence dating to the 70s suggests that this market was the milieu of a multipolis competition. The Athenians, the Spartans, the Aginetans, the Corinthians, the Megarians, and also minor political communities such as Opuntian, Locrians, and Phrygians emphasized their own merits regarding the, the freedom of all Greece, their contribution uh, to the freedom of all Greece. Through uh, literary forms uh, such as Aeschylus' Persians, Pindar's Odes, uh, and most of all Simonides' poetry, as well as through monumental dedications, tombs, and cenotaphs inscribed with epigrams which were located in towns, on battlefields, and at the international sanctuaries of Delphi and Olympia, all the single polis underline their own merits in the Pan-Hellenic War against the Persians. Paraphrasing the text, which we will see right now, uh, the Athenians maintained that at Salamis they had prevented all Greece from seeing the day of slavery. The Corinthians maintain that at Salamis they have, uh, they have given the day of freedom to all Greece. The Megarians maintain that they had given me to Megara and Greece the day of freedom. 
The Spartans maintained that at Plataea they diverted from Sparta and Greece the day of slavery, and that at the Thermopylae they tried to crown all Greece with freedom. But let's see the text one by one. I'll come to the conclusions later on. Um, concerning Athens, we have a notice of possibly two poems by Simonides um, concerning the Battle of Salamis and that of the Artemisium, in which, as far as we can assume on the basis of the preserved fragments and of the comments uh, by authors who quote them, the two battles are described as essentially um, Athenian uh, victories. And so does the dedicatory epigram um, of the Parasemata of the Persian ships, uh, which the Athenians dedicated to Artemis uh, Proseoa at the Artemisium. In Aeschylus's Persians, uh, uh, dating to 472, uh, the Athenians receive uh, a Panhellenic task by the chorus. They are defined as sons of the Greeks instead of the most common formula, uh, sons of the Athenians by the Satanaeum. Here they are defined as son of the Greeks and are invited to go and free all Greeks. In this epigram, uh, which is inscribed on the basis of the Athenian monuments for uh, those fallen in the Persian Wars in the Athenian Demosion Sema, also dating to the 70s on paleographical grounds, those who fell on land and sea, Pedoi, Tecaio, Kiporon, Epineon, um, most likely to be uh, referred to those who fell at Psitaleia and Salamis, they are celebrated for having saved all Greece from the day of slavery. They kept all Greece from seeing a day of slavery. A similar formula has been supplied by West, and it is uh, almost unanimously accepted um, in the elegy for the Spartans at Plataea. Uh, here, the Battle of Plataea is presented as a mainly Spartan achievement, and the Plataea Machoi are celebrated for keeping the day of slavery away from Sparta and Greece. Two other texts uh, concerning instead the Spartan action at the Thermopylae, uh, the famous encomium uh, quoted by Diodorus and the funerary epigram, uh, which is transmitted by the Palatine Anthology attest to the celebration uh, of the defeat of the Thermopylae as an attempt, albeit a failed one, to crown all Greece with freedom. So as a heroic sacrifice to the benefit of all Greeks. The Corinthians as well in four epigrams which are preserved in literature and one of them also on stone, they also celebrated their achievement in the Second Persian War as a contribution to the freedom of all Greeks. In all of them, we have, as you can see, a Panhellenic uh, extension of the Corinthian merits. Similarly, also the Megarians um, celebrate their eagerness to uh, foster the day of freedom for Greece and Megara uh, in an epigram which is uh, preserved on a later Kaik stone, but surely is post Persian and uh, which accompanied the heroine of the fallen. Again, uh, the Eginetans, uh, um, specifically the Eginetan sailors, are celebrated by Pindar for their decisive contribution to the victory at Salamis. There is no explicit uh, reference here to a Panhellenic dimension. However, the exemplum of the Trojan War and the parallel between the Aginetan sailors at Salamis and the Ayakids that Pindar introduces at the beginning of this ode surely has the effect of um, panalhenizing the Aginetan role at Salamis. And this parallel, moreover, uh, also appears in the same period in the sculptural decoration of the Temple of Athena Aphaia in Aegina. Eventually, also minor um, communities such as the uh, Opuntian Locrians, the Eastern Locrians, celebrate their role in the Persian War as a Panhellenic achievement. They died here in Duper Elados. So, um, 
every poll is um, extolled its own contribution uh, to the common uh, war against the Persians. What is notable to me here um, is that none of them tried to exclusively um, take over the common victory. The point was to show to have participated to the war against the Persians, not to have been better than others, uh, not to have done something especially noteworthy uh, compared to others. The recurrence of the very same uh, Homeric formula, such as Dulion Emar, uh, Eleutheron Emar, the day of freedom, the day of slavery, are telling to this regard, I think, since they appear in these texts as a kind of hashtag. Every police tagged. Uh, their memorials, uh, a tomb, a monument, an ode, whatever, with a tag which was shared and recognizable on the Pan-Hellenic platform and which referred to a common discourse, focusing on who had given a contribution for the freedom of Greece against the Persians. So this reading suggests an ongoing competition among the Polish, uh, Polish which was, however, inclusive, not exclusive. The relationship among the different civic memories on the Pan-Hellenic scene was paratactical, not hierarchical. The pressure exerted by the single local representations was not so strong to overwhelm the Pan-Hellenic horizon. The scenario we can grab from the post-war evidence is that of a poly-Hellenic juxtaposition of civic memories on the Pan-Hellenic scene. All the local points of view can coexist within a common framework. Notably, among these uh, polite representations, two uh, seem to be shared on a sovereign polite scale. Both in Aeschylus and Pindar, for instance, Salamis is depicted as a mostly Athenian victory and Plataea as a mainly Spartan group. It seems that everyone agreed on that. It was a local point of view, therefore, uh, which was shared on a sovereign local scale by others, who nonetheless could freely extol also their own merits. So in, in that sovereign local acknowledgement resides the hegemonic power of the Athenian characterization of Salamis and of the Spartan characterization of Plataea, not in their claims per se. Well, none of these of this polyhellenic juxtaposition of civic memories on the Panhellenic scene, none of these appears in Herodotus. In Herodotus, we find a completely different history, or um, I should say, we find uh, completely different stories. As I have tried to show in my book, uh, decade after decade, the historical development of the Pentecontetia radically transformed and problematized this paratactical polyhellenic juxtaposition of local memories. The preeminence gained by Athens as the leader of the Delian League and the growing hostility with Sparta and its allies, culminating in the outbreak of the so called First Peloponnesian War from the end of the 60s to the mid 40s had a decisive impact on the memorialization of the Persian Wars during the central decades of the Pentecontetia. The Athenian Argive Alliance in 462-1 marked an epochal break in the fifth century history of the interstate relations in Greece, and accordingly a watershed in the reshaping of the memory of the Persian Wars. That was the turning point at least the first turning point in the memorialization of the Persian Wars during the fifth century. As far as we can tell from the evidence, it was mostly Athens as the new leader among the Greeks who carried out a thorough revision of the memory of the Persian Wars and did so together with their allied Poles, Argos and Plataea and at the expenses of Sparta and Thebes. At the time of the so-called First Peloponnesian War, the Athenian public discourse and monumentality, both in Athens and Delphi, channeled in fact anti-Spartan feelings, which are intertwined with pro argive orientations, as well as an anti-Theban perspective, which is in turn associated with pro platean feelings. The evidence of the period includes the uh, statue of the Athena Promachos, the addition of the painting of Koinoe to the, um, to the um, uh, pictorial cycle in the Swapoikile, uh, 
the Athenian and the Argive statuary groups at Delphi, portraying their respective civic heroes, the temple of Athen Athena Rei at Plataea with its mythical paintings uh, prefiguring the Theban medism, and the development of the Athenian cutting catalog in a philo Argive anti Theban and anti Spartan perspective. I cannot comment upon each of them in detail, um, but again, what I'm saying is the result of their study as uh, pieces of a system, uh, making sense only together and su suggesting certain meanings, certain semantic threads uh, in light of their dialogue and interconnectedness. From this point onwards, what was at stake for each police was not anymore uh, to state their presence, to affirm their participation to the war against the Persians. Now the point was to stress their preeminence, to show that they fought better than others, that they gave a major contribution, that others instead gave no or only minor contribution, that they sacrificed themselves for the benefit of all Greece, uh, while others showed um, localistic and parochial behavior and so on. So new stories took shape, all the events were reshaped, new episodes were imagined, at one's own advantage and to the expense of others. A multifaceted panorama of local intentional histories began to crumb the Greek landscape of developing oral traditions. The generous Athenians suffer the sack of their city in order to save the whole of Greece. The faithful Plataeans never miss their duties. The neutral Argives do not participate to the war because they are under threat by the Spartans. The selfish Spartans are willing to defend the Peloponnese only. The Aeginetans fled before fighting at Plataea. This is just a selection of, of these new stories, new stories um, which are attested for the first time in, in this period. The competition among the polis had turned from inclusive to exclusive. The relationship among the single polite memories had become hierarchical instead of paratactical. And the pressure which was exerted from the parochial claims of the single police overwhelmed the common Panhellenic framework. Uh, we must not forget that it is in this period, in these times, during or just after the First Peloponnesian War, that Herodotus first set foot in Athens. As the last part of my talk, I would like to tell you the story of the selfish Spartans who uh, all throughout the Second Persian War in Herodotus's narration seemed to care only for themselves. They did not seem to care for the defense of Greece. They did not want to go out of the Peloponnese and wanted to defend the Peloponnese only. And to this aim, they were fervently committed together with other Peloponnesians to the construction of a defensive wall at the eastern of Corinth. They always made an excuse to give up fighting or, or to procrastinate their intervention in battle. Uh, they arrived late on the battlefield and so on. Integral to the same story and opposite to the parochial and anti panhellenic behavior of the Spartans, the Athenians, all throughout Herodotus's narration of the Second Persian War, appear instead as committed to the defense of Greece, uh, ready to self-sacrifice, philanthropic, truly panhellenists. Um, now I'm going to read or paraphrase um, some portions of portions of Herodotus's narration and will give special emphasis um, to the two main recurrent and narrative patterns showing the, the selfishness of the Spartans, uh, the construction of the wall at the Isthmus and the religion excuses. Uh, I apologize for not including the passages in the PowerPoint, um, stupid of me, but I will provide with all the references and anyone who should be interested. On the eve of the battle at Thermopylae, the Spartans did not want to send their army against Xerxes, except for Leonidas and the 3000, because they were celebrating the 300, sorry, because they were celebrating the Carneia festival. Similarly, the other Peloponnesians sent only an advance guard until the Olympic festival would finish. At the beginning of book eight, during the preparation for the battle of the Artemisium, Herodotus states that the Athenians gave up the command of the fleet when the allies protested because of what was important to them was the survival of Greece 
and they knew that if they made a leadership a point of dispute, Greece was lost. Different from the Spartans, who just before had threatened that they would not fight if the command were assigned to the Athenians instead of themselves. Later on, the contrast between Themistocles and Eurybiades offers a similar representation of the Athenians as committed uh, to a strategy which was aimed at the defense of all Greece, and instead the Peloponnesians as reluctant to leave the Peloponnese. And not by chance, Themistocles, at the end of his speech, uh, urges Eurybiades to endorse his strategy for a naval battle in the Saronic Gulf telling him that that would be the best strategy also for the defense of the Peloponnese. Um, I'm quoting uh, the words by Themistocles in a Herodotus narration. Uh, the final point to note about my plan, which concerns what you all take to be the crucial issue, is that by staying here, Eurybiades, you'll be defending the Peloponnese just as effectively as if you were stationed off the Isthmus and you won't be drawing the enemy into the Peloponnese either if you're sensible and adopt my plan. So with these words centers, centered on the defense of the Peloponnese, Themistocles convinced Eurybiades to stay uh, there uh, and fight the decisive sea battle in the Saronica. Slightly later, however, on the eve of the battle, the contrast between the Athenian and the Spartan attitude becomes even sharper. And from a narrative standpoint, it is consistently built on the motive of the wall at the Isthmus. After the Athenian triremes have sailed up to Salamis and have already lined up for the naval battle, the Spartans, together with the Corinthians and other Peloponnesians, who are um, ironically uh, defined by Herodotus as full of terror over the danger facing Greece, they stopped at the Isthmus where they built the wall which was something Herodotus says that they had discussed and decided to do. No one else in the Peloponnese, continues ironically Herodotus, bothered to do anything, even though the Olympic and Carnean festivals were over by now. Herodotus' description of the hectic work for the construction of the wall is ideally framed by two comments, which are clearly intertwined. Herodotus first states that um, the Greeks were seized by terror. The Peloponnesians were particularly afraid because they were on Salamis, about to fight for Athenian territory. And if they lost the battle, they would be trapped and blockaded on an island, leaving their own territory undefended. And later on, um, three or four uh, paragraphs uh, after, um, as a kind of recap of the description given above, Herodotus concludes, so the Greeks at the Isthmus undertook the task of building a defensive wall because the race they were running was an all or nothing affair and because they did not expect great things from the fleet. Although their colleagues on Salamis heard what they were doing, it did not alleviate their fear, which was for the Peloponnese rather than for themselves. So this um, um, parochialism and uh, self-interested behavior of the Spartans uh, reaches its peak on the eve of the Battle of Plataea. That very battle that on a Pan-Hellenic scale, starting from the immediate aftermath of the war, was characterized as a mainly Spartan achievement. Herodotus's comments on the Spartan exclusive interest in the defense of the Peloponnese permeates subtly um, the narration of the crucial moment before the battle itself. The moment when the agreement for a joint Athenian-Spartan uh, intervention was at stake. Um, paragraphs seven to 11 in book nine. On the eve of the battle, the Spartans are said to be uh, celebrating the Yakintu. At the same time, Herodotus says, uh, incidentally, um, Herodotus is really a genius, um, says in, incidentally that the wall of the Isthmus had been already built for a part. It already had the parapets built on it. Then follows the debate between the Athenian ambassadors and the Spartan efforts. The former, who had been sent to the Peloponnese in order to ask for a supportive Spartan intervention, preferred that the Athenians, despite being left alone by the allies, refused to make arrangements with the Persians. And they also accused the Spartans of, of neglecting the Pan-Hellenic cause. According to the Athenian ambassadors, the Spartans, now that the wall is completed, 
would be um, willing to, to betray the initial agreement with the Athenians on uh, facing the Persians together in Boeotia. So the ambassadors vigorously ask the efforts for an immediate Spartan intervention. Uh, the efforts um, play for time, one day, two days, eventually 10 days. And in the meantime, Herodotus observes, again, incidentally, that all the Peloponnesians fortify the Hispans all in a hurry. So the efforts hesitation appears um, as an intentional strategy in order to complete the construction of the wall. And this reading of the efforts behavior is suggested by Herodotus himself, slightly after, when he compares the behavior of the Spartans on the present occasion and earlier at the time of Alexander's uh, arrival. Why, Herodotus asks, at the time of Alexander of Macedonia's mission to Athens, was it so important to the Lacedaemonians that the Athenians should not go over to the Persian side? And why were they then completely unconcerned on this little occasion? Herodotus goes on. I don't know the answer, except to say that they had completed the wall across the Isthmus and thought that they, that they had no further need of the Athenians. The Spartans eventually accept to send their army in Attica, not because the efforts themselves decided to do so, but because an influential stranger in Sparta, Phileus from Tegea, persuades them. And consistently with the semantic of this narrative portion as a whole, Phileus does not bring into play uh, themes such as the defense of Attica and, the, or, and or the defense of all Greece. But he prefigures to the efforts that if the Athenians could have come to terms with the Persians, the wall of the Isthmus, however strong, would not be enough to ensure the defense of the Peloponnese. So the decisive argument convincing the Spartan efforts to send an army to fight the Persians was, again, the defense of the Peloponnese. Uh, notably, uh, the selfishness and uh, parochialism of the Spartans and their generosity and reliability of the Athenians all, almost always go together. Uh, their contrast is often dramatized in the very same narrative context, where it does not work as an ornament, um, but as the effective engine of the development of the events. Uh, so this fact, the, the fact that several narrative portions, even long ones, are built on this very opposition between the selfish Spartans and the generous Athenians is a strong element, I think, in favor of the fact that um, on the one hand, the um, antinomic characterizations of the Spartans and the Athenians were the two faces of uh, the one and the same coin, two faces of the one and the same story. And this story can be described as a perfect example of intentional history, which likely developed in Athens at the time of the first Peloponnesian War, because that was the time when as the evidence outside Herodotus, the non-historiographical evidence which I have recalled before suggests, Athens, together with Argos, began reshaping the Persian Wars uh, in an anti-Sparta and anti-Peloponnesian perspective. Uh, so th there is no need to wait uh, for the Archidamian War to appreciate the impact of contemporary history on how the Persian Wars were narrated by Herodotus. To conclude, I would like to stress just two brief possible uh, research directions concerning Herodotus as, a, uh, as the historian of the Persian Wars and Herodotus as an oral historian more in general. Concerning the former, I think that together with the clear impact of, of the Archidamian War and of even later times in shaping the Athenian and the Spartan behavior in Herodotus's narration, we should also consider uh, those stories whose existence is suggested by the evidence outside Herodotus, which had already been reshaped by their own collective actors at an earlier stage, mid fifth century. Concerning the latter, I suggest to think of Herodotus as an oral historian, not only in the sense that he collects oral materials, as Jacobi put it, um, neither he is an oral historian because he collects oral testimonies as a modern anthropologist 
as Evans somehow put it. He does another operation, and it is this other operation that, in my opinion, qualifies him as an oral historian. Herodotus is an oral historian also because he takes stories, he takes oral history, he takes oral stories as history. He builds several portions of his own narration of the Persian War on the intentional histories of their protagonists, mostly the Athenians. To this regard, we might say that what Herodotus offers is not history in the 19th century onwards sense. It is at least partially minimal history in Asman's terms. Herodotus's Persian Wars are for a great part the Persian Wars not as they happened, but as they were remembered by their later conflicting protagonists. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>